Good morning. And thank you too for those of you who have been praying for me uh, this past week. I mentioned last Sunday that uh, I wasn't quite sure what was going to be taking place. Uh, and uh, my mind was thinking more in terms of uh, actually getting around in a place I didn't know. I had to go to Switzerland, uh, both first to London for some meetings and then to Switzerland to um, engage with a group of mission leaders who are part of a group called OMF, Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Uh, that's the group we were out in the Philippines with a long time ago uh, in a previous existence, it feels now. Uh, and it was a, an interesting event. So thank you for your praying. What you didn't realize was that there were events that took place that I didn't know about either last Sunday, part of which was... Uh, I apparently was meant to be bringing the Bible reading or the preaching to the group. Uh, and I got an email just before I left on Tuesday morning saying, I'm very sorry, we forgot to tell you, but you're doing your preach for this group of 25 international leaders. Uh, well, it was good that I didn't know ahead of time. And uh, traveling internationally is quite helpful. You can sit in an airport for a couple of hours and use the time profitably. Uh, but thank you for your praying. I really sense that God used what's been prepared uh, for this series for them and for us. Uh, and uh, your praying for me, I think, was a significant part of what God was able to do in that. So thank you. It's very interesting. It was a group of international leaders, but it was also this specifically Western leaders from o this group called OMF of which I, because I'm chair of the trustees now of OMF, was part. And there was two things that came through. One, the really dire situation, well, not dire, but challenging situation that we face in certain of our established, what we would have called Christian countries. Netherlands, Switzerland, UK, Germany where the church has been in decline for the last 50 or 60 years, where the support of mission has begun to decrease. And that was contrasted by a group who are working in different parts of Europe where they're seeing something totally different. We call that particular part of the OMS work New Horizons. And to hear that actually there's a, the church in Ukraine, which we've heard about through Andy and Tatiana, the couple we're praying for this month, they're desperate to get overseas to share the gospel. And here's a church that Andy came and told us about is growing and is being refined in spite of all the upheaval and the trauma of war and difficulty. Hearts are being touched. The church in Slovenia, and no, I didn't know where, and I still don't know where that is either, which is a, a real sense of God at work in this church in Slovenia. And again, a similar thing. We want to get a seize. We want to, we want to share the good news of Jesus has come to our hearts. The Bulgarian church, the Romanian church. And we saw in contrast, and I was really encouraged to hear that God is at work in his world. But at the same time, heart was heavy because the reality of what we were experiencing and are experiencing in our own country is one which doesn't mirror that. We have a faithful church in the UK. But one of the things that I brought out of uh, the story of Elijah, and we're going to look at it uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we had a hundred prophets stuck in a cave, faithfully committed to God, but disconnected. And I shared, actually, as we flew across France, beautiful country, France, from 38,000 feet. And not very big, at 675 miles an hour. And you look down and you go, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful country. And as I thought about that, then I looked at the villages below and I thought, I wonder what lives are like on the ground. Faithful but disconnected. And it's only when you get down to the ground level and you work with people, you see the reality. Talked about faith. Um, you're going to get two sermons today, sorry. <laughs> Obadiah, 
who we'll see in a couple of weeks' time, who was fearful. Faithful. He was the one that had hid the hundred prophets. Or there was Elijah, who was faithful and effective. And I felt that the Lord was saying to us, and the challenge that I brought to this group was, let's look at ourselves. Are we faithful but disconnected? Are we faithful but fearful and so ineffective? Or are we, like Elijah, faithful and effective? And of course, the heart's desire, because our hearts matter, was that we be faithful and effective. And I would like to bring the same challenge to us here. And this is what this series is about. We are faithful. We are here. We love the Lord. But are we connected? We're faithful. We're here. We enjoy one another's company. But are we fearful of the consequences of what it means to be a fully committed to God? What does it take to be like Elijah? Faithful and effective. Because the story, as we will see it over these next few weeks and months, as we explore Elijah and Elisha, is that actually this man, who boldly stepped out, brought about a change, not only in Israel itself, but also in the nations around it. One man, standing up, made a difference. We are God's people. We're living in dark days, difficult days. But we can make a difference. My prayer and our prayer as we look through this series is that we will not just hear, not just be encouraged and excited, but that we might be motivated to be like the Ukrainian church, who in spite of all the obstacles stand up, or the emerging Slovenian church who's saying, I want to go. Can't afford it. It's impossible, but God can make a way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God. And whether we enjoy that faithfulness or whether we turn our back on it, you and your purposes are being fulfilled. We have a great movement of people across our nations at the moment, which provides tremendous opportunities for those who have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel to to be shared with Christian love, Christian care, and the Christian message. And we thank you for the way that you are beginning to draw people to yourself from Muslim background, from secular background. You're taking Chinese and bringing them to share the gospel with Syrians in Germany. Lord, you're amazing. You're indescribable. We've sung about that. We want to be part of that sharing of your love and your care. We want to be drawn into the purposes of God which are exciting and wonderful. So, Father God, as we explore this passage this morning, take us And by your Holy Spirit, move us not just to consent with our hearts and our minds, but to put into practice in our living what it is you have to say to us today, we ask. For Jesus' sake. Amen. First of all, is that sort of central? Yes, it does look too. Good. So, Elijah in 1 Kings 17, and we're looking at faith that stands firm And we're looking at this bigger series, Hearts Matter, or Heart Matters. And uh, the focus and direction is we want to have healthy hearts, not just so that we keep living, uh, but hearts for God that beat with his passion, and, but also with his wisdom. And we're exploring two great men of God, Elijah and Elisha. I am approaching my 60th year. And I mentioned last week 
What was the world like when you were 70 or and now, when you are now 70 or 80 years of age. How many people here had a ration book? I missed out by three years. My brother had one. You still got it. And the sad thing is, Gloria uses it to feed him. <laughs> or so he tells me. It's always known to complain. No, no, no. We're moving on quickly. From the time of King Solomon to the time of King Ahab, we're talking round about 60 to 65 years. That's almost my lifetime, and for some of you, it's your lifetime. And everybody that has been born since in Israel of that time, would have grown up in a kingdom or a nation that had begun to decline. We don't know at what point in Solomon's life his heart was turned. We read about it in 1 Kings chapter 12. His heart was turned because he married foreign wives and they brought foreign gods. But we do know that towards the end of Solomon's reign, it went from bad to worse. As he turned away from God and syncretism or worship of other things other than God Almighty began to become part of culture in Israel and the people of God, decline set in. We know that after he died, there was a civil war. And the ten tribes to the north were ruled by this king called Jeroboam, and the two to the south by a guy called Rehoboam. And all the kings and the ten tribes of the north, which is where our focus is during this series, did evil in God's sight and displeased him. And each one lived more ungodly than the previous one. So a nation which had been absolutely fantastic, in which people had come to it, because of the wisdom and the wealth and the security that was there as they followed God, went from glory to ruin. And as I've been thinking about this story over the last few months, and particularly hearing what I heard over this past week, that would sort of mirror pretty much where we are as a nation, but also as a church in the UK. And we're part of it. Now if the church stands up to speak, its voice is unwelcome. There's been such a huge change in society. And we see the impact of that. The vast increase in our own country of poverty. I was sharing, we had a friend who we met too many years ago for me to, it's a bit embarrassing to account, but I met up with her in Switzerland uh, and her husband, and she was asking, what do we do here? And I said, well, different things. And when she heard about the food bank, she said, wow, we don't have anything like that in Switzerland. We have no need. We do have a need. Now, we're not poor in the sense of the shanty towns in Africa or Brazil or Latin America. We have running water, we have heat, we have rooms over our head, but we see on a regular basis people who are in crisis, who are poor. This past week, I understand at Food Bank again, two or three large families, not enough money to put food in the cupboard. It's an example of where we have come from. I'm not saying that 70 years ago everybody had food. The vast increase that we see in poor mental health, which has our health services stretched to breaking point. 
often a direct result of family breakdown and dislocation of relationships and lack of hope and lots of other things. This is a society in which we live and it's changed. 60, 70 years ago, it was God-fearing. I'm not saying it was all Christian, it wasn't. I'm not saying it was all right, it wasn't. But it was God-fearing and values were godly values. I remember my grandfather coming in and seeing me play cricket when I was about 14 years of age. So it's a little while ago, and I didn't play well. But it stands out in my memory. My granddad wasn't a Christian, nor was my grandmother at that time. But I can remember, it stands out vividly, it's one of those sort of childhood memories, of his anger, and he wasn't an angry man, he was a very placid man. And the vehemence with which he spoke of a situation where his niece was going out, had a relationship with a married man. And she'd fallen pregnant. And the guy was going to divorce and she was going to remarry. He refused to go to the wedding. He wasn't a Christian, but his values, he said, that's just wrong. Uh, and I thought, oh, granddad, calm down. <laughs> uh, and it sticks to my memory. Today? Would we give that much thought? And I mentioned that because I want us to get into our heads that what we read about taking place in King Ahab's day and the decline of moving from godly values to ungodly and the impact that it has mirrors very much the history of our own country and our churches across our country over the last 65, 70 years. But God was still at work. God still had his purposes that were going to be worked through. And it was worked through in a minority. But it was a minority that we learn from to help us to recognize and see how we live in a society that was similar to the time of King Ahab and Elijah. Because our hearts matter, and it is right at the center of the core of our being, our hearts that actually overflow and make the difference which is why we look. What does it mean to have a healthy heart? I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that we have a God who speaks. We have a God who's spoken through his word. We have God's word, the scriptures. The Bible is there for us. And God has spoken into every circumstance and situation of life. This is a living word of God. And there is no experience, no situation in which scripture does not speak into it. That's one of the exciting things about just sort of being part of this past week for me. You know, to remind myself, we, we talk about the sovereignty of God and the way God works, but actually to hear it comes alive. God's purposes are never thwarted. And he is a God who speaks into light and dark. God speaks, and he speaks through Elijah. Verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, now, it doesn't say there, God spoke to Ahab and says, this is what you should do. I find that quite interesting. It seems as though Elijah has looked at, seen and explored the situation that he faces, and he's looked at God's word, and then he has acted. Now, what am I talking about? Well, way, way back in the wilderness, when God spoke first of all to his people after bringing them out of Egypt, he said to them, honor me and I'll bless you. I'll bless you with rain. I'll bless you with security. I'll bless you with peace. But if you turn your back against me, I'm going to withhold the rain. I'm going to withhold my peace. I'm going to withhold my blessing, and it will be an experience not of joy and peace, but of judgment and discord. 
And I believe that as she has Elijah, who through his life had remained faithful, was a man who knew God's word. And then he took God's word and he applied it. We're going to see that in a little while. So God speaks. But if we're going to be faithful, we've got to know both about God, which comes through his word, but we've also got to know God through our experiences. So it's one thing, isn't it, to fill our heads with Bible to read it. Now, I trust that actually as a community of God's people, we do take God's word seriously. Now, I know I expect a percentage here, and quite a big percentage, find it difficult to pick up your Bible and read it regularly. You cannot remain faithful without reading God's word regularly. Now, that's not to say we've got to be hard and fast and religious about it and and sort of get worked up. But there needs to be a heart that has a hunger to hear God speak. I had three days away from Joy this week. Peace and quiet for her. But actually, there were experiences I had I wanted to share, and there were experiences she had that she wanted to share. And the wonders of modern science, Skype does it free. Uh, So I did Skype her one morning. Uh, and she was distinctly sleepy. Great to be able to see and hear. I forgot that the clocks were different. (laughs) So it was my fault. The heart that wants to hear the voice of the one who's closest to us Or who is closer than God himself? He's spoken. We have his word. So yes, Elijah spent, I'm sure, time in God's word. But he didn't just spend time in God's word to fill his head. He used it to have an experience of God in his living. I am pretty convinced that Elijah didn't wake up one morning and just say, I've got to go and talk to the king. This is a process that he had been working through. And he had a life that was being lived out in an, as a godly person in an ungodly society. So I imagine that there were many a time when he had to make a choice. When his friends were going down to the temple of Baal, does he go with them or does he stay? You know, life's made up of little choices, isn't it? Do I choose to open up my Bible and to read God's word in the morning? Or do I have that extra snooze? Or when I do choose to open God's word and it says something to me, do I actually choose to then put it into practice? And I think the faith that stood firm for Elijah was a faith that took God's word and applied it in lots of little choices in daily living. So that when the time came, he was in a position to be able to go and to approach Ahab as king. Now here's a king who wasn't averse to killing people. Who had complete autonomy over life and death of his subjects. But God speaks through Elijah because God... Elijah knew about God and knew God. One of the challenges, what is it that God would have us as believers say to our society? What is it that would help? And what is it that should be proclaimed Actually, this is ungodly, and God, we want to see you act. For Elijah, it was clear. It was about the land and the rain. So faith stands firm when we use God's word. So actually, are we as Christian people looking at God's word and saying, actually, how does this apply in my family? 
How does this apply in my community? How does this apply in my workplace? How does this apply in society as a whole? Lord, we, we have a heart for you, and you have a heart for people. Help us to see. And, and all of a sudden, faith doesn't become just me and my quiet time or me and my walk. It actually expands. I caught just a very brief bit of Radio 4 in the service this morning. Uh, and there's a talk about peace. And the person that was preaching said he used to be part of a gang. Uh, and he became a Christian. And he became part of a newer gang. A bigger gang. And he's talking about the faith of the church. And a gang that had a purpose. A gang that had a community. A gang that had passion. And a gang that was brought up into a broader narrative than just me and my whatever. That's what we are as people of faith. We're drawn into something bigger and more purposeful that brings meaning and purpose into our lives that goes way beyond what we can imagine. This lady I spent uh, 24 hours with who we met in Switzerland and met 30, 40 years ago. She said to me, the reason I got married is because of you. Uh, wow, what did I do? Well, apparently we took, she came with us to a little mission hospital in Niger in West Africa before we went to Bible college. And we were asked to chaperone her and look after her. She was an 18-year-old, just about to go off to do medical studies. Uh, we didn't do a very good job because while she was there, she met this doctor, and without us even realizing it, a romance developed. Uh, so we were pretty useless chaperones. He was older. He was from a foreign country. For her to have a relationship with him would probably mean for her to leave her home. And I, apparently that night, was preaching from the book of Ruth and talking about how God took this girl and brought her into a relationship with an older man to a foreign country and how God used her and blessed her and through that became a blessing which went far beyond oh wow I had no idea I probably left that meeting that night thinking what a waste of time but God used it I had a sense of that on Thursday when I preached to this group of church leaders, of established believers with responsibility for ministry to to billions through OMF. Now, they don't reach billions, but that responsibility for work in China, for work in Korean Peninsula, for the work in Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, for the leaders in the Western world. And a sense that God has given me something to say that was significant. Now, what am I doing there for? Pastor of a small little struggling church in Portsmouth. Part of a church which has really, as a nation, nationally declined. And yet drawn up into something that could be bigger for that half an hour. That may have eternal consequences, not because I did it, but because we're drawn up into something that's so much bigger. I could have turned around and said, sorry, I'm too busy, I can't go to that meeting. And we can all make excuses, can't we? But faith stands firm when we use God's word, when we apply it, when we say, Lord, help me to be able to see what does this mean for me? And then that wonderful experience of seeing it transforming and changing the ordinary into the supernatural. Isn't that something to be excited about? Isn't something to think, actually, it's worth getting up 10 minutes earlier just to open God's word. What's in it today for me? We were up late this morning because I've been a bit tired. And Joy read from Psalm 103 probably because she thought, if I don't do it, we won't do it. And it was talking about how God is 
anger and justice is so different from ours. You know, that spoke into our personal situation. You think, wow, we needed that. Isn't that something exciting? Faith stands firm when we use God's word. Not just when we read it, but when we use it. Faith stands firm because we see that in the way that Elijah talks to Ahab. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve. The Lord. He is the Lord. He is God. He is the creator. He gave me life. He's given you, Ahab, life. He's given us, you, his nation. The Lord is the one whom we should acknowledge, not this other little guy called Baal. We'll get to that in a while, a few weeks' time. But he is the God of Israel. He's the one I serve. He's the one who lives. You know, you take the living God with you as God's representative. If you have a relationship with him into your family, into your work, into your everything. And Elijah knew that. Why? Because I think he had made those choices along the way as he grew up. He knew about God, yes, but he knew and experienced God because he used God's word. He's the one who lives. He is the one who created and controls nature. And he uses what he knows from the previous, from the scriptures in the Torah. And if you don't serve God, there'll be no rain. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow, is that putting faith on the line? We don't read that God said to him, this is what I'm going to do. He reads scripture and he applies it. And he does it before this man who is not a verse. Risk taker. And he's a risk taker because he knows God and he knows about God. Let's move on. Verse 2. What's the first word in verse 2? It's a little one. Anybody like to read it for me? Then. Oh, thank you. Good, we are awake. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He'd done all of this. Then God spoke. And this is the trouble and the struggle that we have with faith. We have to take steps before we experience God's presence or or provision. That God was a God of care. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn. Eastward. And hide in the Kerith ravine. God knew... That for Elijah to stand up and do what he did, his life was at risk. And God cares for us. So when we stand and have that act of faith, we can know that there is a God who will look after us and care for us. Now that doesn't mean that everybody gets cared for. There is a persecuted church and there are martyrs. There will be people who die today because they're believers. God cares for them. Their future is now one of peace. But in this account, we see Elijah is told to leave, to turn, because there needs to be a period of time at which actually what he has said takes place, that there be neither dew nor rain. So actually, when Elijah does this, he becomes an unpopular presence. And we so often look for faith and for God's people to be popular, to be liked, to be, wow, thank you so much for pointing out that I, I, I'm wrong. Actually, the opposite, isn't it? And we're so risk adverse and we're so comfortable orientated that we don't like to be uncomfortable and we don't like to be unpopular. But often God calls us when we stand firm to be unpopular. That doesn't mean to say we have to be nasty with it. 
And so often we can be. But here's an unpopular presence. Here's an unpopular presence for Ahab. Because Ahab realized he has no control over nature. And here he is, king, and what's going to happen? We know that for the next three years, no rain, no dew. His people are going to suffer. So it's not just Ahab, but it's also the people of Israel. All the people are going to struggle and suffer. I wonder how many hungry people there were in Israel in that three years. Were their food banks full? Probably not, because there wasn't much food. But God cared for Elijah. You will drink from the brook, and I've ordered the ravens to feed you there. Go east of the Jordan, outside of Israel's territory, and there's a brook there. And day and night, there's a miracle that will take place. Raven will bring you meat and bread. Now, quite what particular bird that was, but they're sort of like the crow family. Ravens. Uh, They're not known for doing very much apart from attacking each other uh, and for eating roadkill. So every day, Elijah has... A miracle. A miracle of nature to help and perhaps assure him that the God of nature who can made it, who controls it, was at work. How many days is three years, mathematicians? Three times 365 in your head, please. I can't remember it up. Any mathematicians here? It must be a thousand and something or other. Thank you. A thousand and something five or something. Something like that. Can you imagine what it was like to be alone for that length of time? To be waiting for what's going to happen next? I struggle to have two hours quiet and on my own. Much to my shame. Day in, day out. Bread in the morning and meat. Water by the brook. Nothing to do. Nothing to do except perhaps pray. Nothing to do except perhaps spend time with God. Nothing to do except perhaps explore the nature and character. But I'm sure there must have been some worries. What have I done? Is it right? How long? Three years. God cares for Elijah. So what is this faith that stands firm? Well, Elijah obeys, doesn't he? He did what the Lord told him. And there are two sides to this faith thing, isn't there? There is the worked out, reasoned faith action, which takes God's word and applies it into a situation. There is also... The time when God lays on our heart that it is something to do. We just sang just before I came to speak, Here I am, Lord, send me. If you call, Lord, I will go. I can't pick up the Bible and say to you, actually it says in verse 6 of um, Malachi, Martin Rutty, go to the Philippines. But I do know God spoke and called us. In a supernatural way, Not, it wasn't supernatural, it was, it was worked out, but it was a clear sense of being right. I know that God called us here. And it was a, a combination of sort of supernatural, but very natural events that brought us. So there's the reasoned faith. God's word tells me how to live. 
He tells me how to live in relationship with people. We have the Beatitudes, which tell us what character and what actions should follow through. We have that, and it's reasoned faith. Because it's based on what God's word says. There are also those times when God lays it on our heart and says, this is what I want you to do. And to learn that obedience to do that. So this week, an example of that, I sat in the airport and I thought, Lord, what is it you want me to say? And I knew I didn't have very much resources apart from my iPad, which carries quite a lot because you've got Bible and all the other stuff. But what is it? And a real sense that God laid on my heart. This is right. This is for this time. Same would be true about this series. That as we look at the life of the church, Lord, lay it on my heart. What, what, what is the right thing? What is it you want to say to people? We don't just pick up a Bible and think, oh, okay, what, 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 what looks good? What fits? So as we preach and teach here in the church, it's because we believe this is what God is saying through us. We want to be obedient to that. So I want to ask you, are you obedient to what the Lord lays on your heart? Either through his word or through his spirit who prompts you to do something. Elijah obeys and his faith remains firm. His heart was there. He stayed. He waited. He was alone. So it wasn't easy. He was isolated. But he was provided for. Hearts matter. And heart matters. And for a faith that stands firm, Elijah shows us. Now each of us will face choices this week. Choice, are we going to pick up our Bibles? Explore God's word? Choices, are we going to put into practice what God's word says to us? Choices. Choices, are we going to live a godly life? Are we going to make godly choices? Or are we going to go our own way? The center of that will be whether your heart wants to serve the living God. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve. So who do you serve? I trust it's the living God. Because if you don't, the choices will have consequences that will mirror, maybe not to the same extent, the decline of a nation from glory to ruin. And who wants that for their life? Surely be drawn into this narrative which builds and brings peace. Albeit with struggle, is something that is worth moving for. Elijah has a heart for God. He responded to God's leading. He trusted God with his life. He was willing to be patient and to wait for God to speak. And the great thing was, others were blessed eventually because his heart stood firm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word, for the faith and trust of your servants that we see, but also the servants who chose not to walk with you as, as are an example for us too. Lord, we want to be like David. Give us an undivided heart. Help us to know not about you alone, but to know you, to experiencing you. So through the power and working of your Holy Spirit, help us to be 
not just hearers, but doers of your word. Help us to experience you in this week that lies ahead for Jesus' sake, for his glory, and for the impact of faith in the living God in a world which does not acknowledge him. Help us, we pray. Amen.